It is time for another episode of The Cultural Hall, and this episode, something we don't talk uh, really very often about at all within the church, certainly uh, not very often here in The Cultural Hall, is uh, about church, church membership, and the loss of church membership. Uh, Historically, if you were in the first 100 episodes, I, uh, who was once upon a time excommunicated and then found uh, my way back to the church, tell my story, talk about uh, what I went through as I went through a church disciplinary council. Uh, But I think maybe there's been one, maybe two other times that we have kind of gone through uh, that discussion, that process, or even broached that topic. Well, uh, today we are joined by David Hyam. Uh, And we are going to uh, chat about his journey, kind of where he finds himself now, and some of the things um, that that hopefully by the end of our discussion, some of those things that you can do to reach out to those who you know may be experiencing um, church discipline or who have been affected by church discipline, certainly an opportunity to learn and to talk about a not very often talked about subject. Uh, Welcome in, David. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, uh, you know, everyone, and I always thought this was sort of funny when people found out that I was excommunicated because I was, I was outed in the time where we excommunicated people. Now we withdraw membership. Is that the correct term? I believe it is. I came in right. I, I was right off the bat on the new terminology when it happened to me. Uh, but people always, and I think it's just natural curiosity uh, of people, they always want to kind of pull you aside or some not so much and say, what'd you do in whatever way you feel comfortable? I would love to know sort of the journey that got to you, got you to where you're at. The journey. Well, I, I, I guess I, I grew up in the church lifetime member, mm-hmm. um, went on a mission and, Where'd you uh, serve? Camp Florida, Tallahassee. Okay. Uh, so I went foreign speaking for an English guy from <laughs> where I come from and uh, ended up uh, coming home. A few years, well, I mean, after my mission, a few uh-huh. years later, I married a widow with seven children and we had one more. So we jumped right into, into yeah, the you did. Oh my God. family thing. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, then you get carried on with life. You're working, you're trying to do your family responsibilities. You're trying to serve your family. You're trying to serving the church and and blessed with a lot of wonderful church experiences and callings uh, a lot of them with youth who i just love to pieces um but then i came to a point where i made some poor choices and found myself after three times as a bishop twice in family wards and once in a young single adult ward found myself uh losing my membership and uh and it's nowhere you thought you'd be and it's terribly embarrassing and it's terribly painful and it's uh not not fun but i've learned a lot of things and so i'm here to talk about a few of them yeah so i'm curious um and again uh your uh, your privacy and confidentiality so i i don't need to know you know the things that it is that you did but i'm curious knowing that you had been a bishop previously and then as you found yourself into whatever those things were whatever those actions or inactions were uh were you like oh no i'm out i know how this works i know the system i know how i engaged with other people when i was a bishop and doing this was it sort of a, a case closed for you or or was it a boy i don't know how the leadership is going to deal with this with me um there are people who would say it would be a case closed thing uh-huh. there are others who are surprised that i lost my membership hmm. And and uh, I don't try to get into that at all because sure. that risks. Um, well, first of all, the thing, if I get into that game, I end up muddying waters and I've decided that I'll just take my lumps. I made some choices that were poor choices uh, for a while. I tried to defend myself. I, I just went around and, and what I kind of had a pat answer. I'd say, look, I I didn't apostatize. I haven't stolen from the church and I haven't had, haven't had sex with anybody. Mm-hmm. And there were people upset that I was running around saying that. And there mm-hmm. were other people that would say, well, that's not what I heard, mm-hmm. which, which to the rumor thing, I, uh, I listened to the first three rumors I heard about myself and I realized this is not fun. It's not good. It's not uh, healthy. Mm-hmm. You end up 
um, being tempted to judge other people, sure. to label other people. You end up tempted to, now you, you try and figure out where did that come from? How is that? Because um, you, you think, well, what nuggets are in there? And, and so then you get caught up in that and it's mm -hmm. painful and it's hurtful. And it just, it just stirs up stuff inside of you that's not healthy. And so after the first three times, I thought, you know what? I'm just, I don't care. Whatever people want to say or think or do, whatever. That's think whatever you want. Yeah, that's a difficult place to get to. Uh, I, I guess a, a thing I had never considered before is, you know, uh, I, I guess I'm grateful. <laughs> I, I, I found gratitude that I had never thought about. No one spoke rumors about me, at least to my knowledge at the time that I was excommunicated. But I think I would have the natural inclination to do what you did, which is, hey, what? What are you saying? I just want you to know, like, quick point of clarification, pal, that thing that you're saying is is not true. Do you think that, that there more was spoken about you because of your previous leadership callings? And do you think that maybe, uh, and this can be a dangerous uh, road to walk down a little bit too, but more of an example made out of you because of being in those leadership positions? I can't speak to that one sure, because that would be guessing somebody else's mind. Um, but I was, all three times I was bishop, it was all on the same stake. Okay. So you get you get to be known in the stake. And, and that, that YSA ward, at one point along the way, they started a YSA stake. And so it ended up in that stake. But, you know, once you've done that, oh, there's a lot of people know you. And once you get released and people start talking a little bit, it goes like, well, and I get it. It's, mm -hmm. uh, if I can use an analogy <clears throat> that's helped me a lot through this. I grew up riding a big yellow school bus, mm -hmm. 35 minutes each way to and from school every day. In the and, snow, right? Um, and there was no heat. Both way, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Windows open and no roof. It was a yeah. convertible. Yeah. Terrible, <laughs> terrible circumstances. So so you ride that, you know, every day after after year after year. And, and that's a whole little community unto itself. And a lot of experiences that you have and a lot of things you learn and some days you have friends on the bus and some days you don't. And some days you know what's going on on the bus in other corners and some days you don't. And sometimes you like the bus driver and sometimes you don't really connect with the bus driver. But you get on every day because it's the only way to school and you've got to go if you want to go to school. Um, I compare the church to the big yellow school bus. And my experience is that there's a whole lot of people of a whole little, lot of backgrounds that are in there. And some days you have feel like you have friends there and some days you don't. And some days you know what's going on, especially if you're a bishop, you got a good feel of what's going on, but some days you don't. And uh, and sometimes you really like the person driving the bus, whether it's your bishop or elders quorum president or state or young men's leader or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't connect so well, but you got to keep getting on if you want to go where the bus is going. And you got to realize that there's a lot of experiences on that bus that aren't always comfortable. But on my bus, there were kids from first grade to 12th grade. And so you've got kids just starting with math and kids doing trigonometry and everything in between. And in church, it's the same way. You've got some that are very good at tithing. They might be in a, you know, a 12th grade level of tithing, mm -hmm. but they might be at a third grade level on not gossiping. But you don't kick them off the bus. That's where they should be. And it's where I should be. But I got kicked off. However, I have felt like I'm getting a ride from the principal. And that's a huge mm. blessing. Hmm. So, so at the point uh, that you were excommunicated, I imagine it's the it. And for those that don't know the scenario, what happens is is uh, if you're going to be uh, withdrawn, membership withdrawn, it is you, uh, the stake president, and counselors, and then all of the high counselor, uh, high councilmen. Correct. That's who was in the room. That changed some point that right before my experience okay but i've been through that experience as a high councilman okay. i've sat in those those councils uh now um i'm not sure if they still do any of them with the whole high council that's not a question for me at this point sure but in my case it was the three members of the state presidency and the state clerk okay two of them i'd been the bishop of and uh and one of them i'd followed into a calling in the past so i knew them what three of them quite well, one of them not not very well at all. And, and an interesting portion of uh, of this whole um, scenario too is that you you can bring 
at least you could, and I would be curious about this situation now, you can bring sort of like character witnesses to say, David is not such a bad guy, you know, or let me tell you a little bit, is that something that still exists? And is that an option that you exercised? I I don't know if it does, and I did not exercise it. Okay. I would assume it still does. I would assume yeah. the church. I mean, they, the more and more and more we go along, the more open they are, right? Having mm-hmm. parents come in with a child sure. being interviewed or, you know, I even had, uh, I as a young single adult bishop, I'd have people come to talk to me and bring a friend with them for support. That was great. More yeah. than happy to. Sure, sure. I remember and, and actually have had a considerable amount of angst um, from family members that I didn't have any witnesses kind of speak to my character because I did it. It was me right. and 15 other men who didn't know me at all, a brand new stake president. Tell us what's going on. And to me, I just was like, listen, I know where I'm at. I know what I believe. I know what I've done. This is not the issue that it's been made. So I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, maybe it was a little bit of hubris. Uh, but I I found myself afterwards going, oh, uh, maybe I maybe I should have had someone come with me so they could get an idea. Uh, And I know that there's still the opportunity to be able to appeal uh, when you have membership withdrawn. Was that ever a consideration that you thought to exercise or did you exercise it? I did. Okay. I did. So um, what happened is I was told at the end of the council that I couldn't apply for rebaptism for a year, maybe a little longer because I had been in leadership. Uh, a couple of weeks later, the state president called me in and said, you know, he'd heard from Salt Lake that it's going to be five years till I can reapply for uh, because wow. I'd been a bishop when things blew up. And uh, so at that point, I decided, you know, like at first I thought it's a year. I'll do this. Um, but when I heard it was five years, I thought, you know, I'm going to stand up to this one. And so I uh, I did appeal, but I don't know really how that process goes. I I've, I don't know very many state presidents that have dealt with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wrote the appeal. I sent it to my state president. I waited several months and then he told me it had been denied. And that's all I know. Yeah. It, it, it's a, it is a fascinating scenario that people who find their membership withdrawn sort of enter into. Tell me if you felt these similar feelings, which is you believe you have faith that God is in control and leading these individuals by the spirit, right? I, I, the whole thing is sort of wrapped around in, in this idea of, you know, God knows what's best and God is leading these people to help institute that in your life. And so you sort of have faith in that faith in how the, the uh, spirit, you know, leads people and can guide people and direct people and, and where maybe the spirit would uh, lead these gentlemen to have your membership withdrawn. There might be another individual with similar circumstances where they're able to keep their membership. And then the tricky part for me was you, you then appeal to the same people who have said what they have said. And so it becomes a, it became a very like uh uh, you know, almost like, well, who are you questioning? Are you questioning the spirit? Like it, it almost right. seemed like an instantly um, kind of off-putting thing. And so I never did. I never did appeal because I just was like, right. I, I guess I, I guess I have faith in this, even though I don't really think that this was how this was supposed to go. But appealing to the people who made the decision is just like, are you sure? It's a, it's a, it's a right. nuance. It's a tricky situation. I don't think that everyone thinks about how this is instituted within the church. Well, two points I'll touch on, on what you said there. First off, the difference in outcomes on different councils. I have seen people in my experience as a bishop, as a high councilman, and just as a, I've seen people for fornication receive um, excommunication. I have seen people for fornication uh, get slapped on the back of the hand, essentially, and say, we're going to withdraw your, or we're going to hold your membership or your, sorry, your temple recommend back for a bit. And Mm -hmm. as the Bishop works with you, um, we'll get you back in again. And I've seen everything in between. And to me, that doesn't speak of unfairness to me. That speaks of fairness Mm. because the judgment is to be made individual to the person. And if we're expecting every every outcome to be equal because the person is a walking, living, breathing human being. 
I don't think that's fair. Sure. When we look at it and say, okay, a council is allowed to look at an individual and their circumstances, because a council does tend to be quite conversational. You know, what were you thinking? What was going on in your life? Why did, what did happen? Why do you think it happened? All those kinds of questions come up in that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, none of those matter if we're going to say you're living, breathing, you did this, you're out. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. I look at it as it's very fair to say it's based on the individual, the circumstances and everything else in the spirit working with the leader. Now, can the leader make mistakes? I suppose they can. Um, the only thing I have to say to that is it is my experience that no matter what you feel, no matter what's going on, the church can take your membership, but they don't take your relationship with Heavenly Father away. And it now is on your responsibility, having lost your membership. Um, certainly, the scriptures teach very clearly they're supposed to go after the one. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, they're supposed to leave the 99, go after the one. But if you're that one, you also, I think, have a responsibility to first reconnect with Heavenly Father through mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And no matter what happened in the council, no matter whether you feel it was fair or not fair, whatever it is, I saw it as my responsibility first and foremost. Now, I'm coming at this, realize that I've, I'm coming at this from having sat in the bishop's chair with someone repenting in front of me and heavenly father prompting me as to what maybe I should be saying to that individual. So I've got a lot of years of experiencing that. And I know full well that church leaders try their best. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm not saying anything about my experience or whatever, but I'm speaking to your, um, if they do make mistakes, if it does seem unfair. Sure, sure. Yeah, I don't think uh, that there. I don't think that there's a leader that maliciously is like, "I'm gonna," right? Or you would right. really hope not, right? But I feel like um, it's my responsibility. Again, coming back to the fact that I spent all those years as a bishop, I listened in. I eavesdropped on all kinds of conversations between the Savior and individuals trying to repent, and you you just learn from that. And so I knew what I needed to do. And as far as building a relationship with Heavenly Father, and that's been my first and foremost um, thing is to, okay, let's let's work on that. I, I want to take a break real quick. When we come back, let's pick it yep. back up right where we're at. Uh, we'll do that coming back in the second block of the Cultural Hall. Here in the second block of the Cultural Hall, encourage you to become a Patreon saint of the Cultural Hall. I happen to know someone who very recently did, and a huge thank you to that individual. You go to patreon.com forward slash the Cultural Hall, and for as little as $5 a month, you can be able to support this here show that you're listening to. We love that you do it. We appreciate that you do it. It's patreon.com forward slash the Cultural Hall. And you get to cool, see the cool videos that uh, get done with each episode. And uh, it's easier for you to listen to the archives if you are a patron saint. So think about it and then do it. Patreon.com forward slash the cultural hall. So, David, uh, one of the things that I think is is sort of um, maybe you don't see coming and maybe it's not everybody's experience, but there's some level of and I think you started to hit on this as we went into the break. There is some uh, bit of maybe shame that exists. Uh, my experience. So excommunicated, and then they said, you know, hey, uh, you're gonna not wear your garments anymore, and you can't uh, pray in church, and you can't hold a calling, and um, we would appreciate, you know, you're not really saying anything in all these classes, and so it it really instantly sort of feels like, well, God doesn't want me, or doesn't want, you know. Because of this, there, there's this sort of divide. And then, um, you know, you talk about re regaining that relationship with Heavenly Father. Did you feel that shame or was it instantaneous for you to be like, nope, I got to work on the relationship? Well, as this happened to me, COVID was just starting to hit uh, full strength. And so we weren't going to church anymore. It mm -hmm. wasn't in person, and I was sitting at home and watching sacrament meeting from home, uh, just like everybody else was, which in some ways felt like a blessing, mm -hmm. because it would have been really hard to walk back into church. Sure. At the same time as I was going through this, I ended up going through a divorce, and um, 
So then it's like, well, I'm not going to go back to the old family ward because I don't want to make everything awkward for everybody or mm -hmm. probably would be anyway. Um, <clears throat> I ended up moving to a different ward within the stake, which um, again, talk about the relationship with Heavenly Father. I had an experience shortly after that. I moved into a part of town I did not know was in this particular ward. I thought it was in a different ward and boundaries had changed while I was in the young single adult world. And um, it, I realized, oh, I'm in this ward that I had been a high councilman over just before being the YSA bishop. And uh, I was listening to conference talks and one morning, uh, just the spirit clearly taught me that the reason I had been assigned a high councilman in that ward was to prepare myself as a soft landing for when I was coming back. And that was a very profound experience for me. And and the people in that ward were really awesome to me. Um, turns out there's a couple people, there's a group I've discovered, I call them the Fellowship of the Forgiven, who uh, have been through something serious, something significant in life, some sort of repentance. I don't say it has to be loss of membership, but there's a lot of people who have lost membership and still go to church. Sure. They don't all go away. I can understand how they go away because it's hard and it is sure. embarrassing and shameful and, and all that sort of thing. But um, people come out of the woodwork and I had people come up and and say, hey, I'm sorry, you're going through this and confess that they'd been through something just quietly. They just I've I've been through this and I had no idea. And mm -hmm. you just go, wow, you know, that's kind of cool that they come out and and share that with you. Um, so I had that going on. Meanwhile. I have other people that I hear about as much as I said, I tried to stay out of the gossip. I like, I stopped listening to any stories. I did hear who was talking about me, which was very interesting to me. I kept oh, so-and-so's talking about so-and-so called up so-and-so about you, whatever. And it's like, okay, I try to push that all away as well. But, um, but you'd hear that. And, and I had a couple experiences where people, one was a, a messaging experience where someone's like, how can you be so happy? What do you, oh, can you, you know, be so happy? That's their question. Right. Okay. Right. And there's somebody active in the church and all, and I love the individual and, but, but they're like, you're coming off. Like you haven't been through anything. You're coming off. Like it doesn't bother you. And it does bother you. As you know, as you know, I've run into people that have lost their membership decades ago who never went back to church and you can still tell are still hurting because of the experience. Sure. They don't care about the church anymore, but it still hurts that they had to go through what they went through. Um, it's not an, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not easy to go through that and, and come through it and come back. Um, but part of that experience I had of what you're referring to is, um, is, is people like, how can you be happy? And, and so I had, you read about in my blog, but I had a guy, we started having steak dinners. That's the way to minister. You have steak dinners. Yeah, and we is. we had <laughs> we had several of these steak dinners. We thought these are great, great discussions. We talked gospel principles and gospel things, and 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 we started inviting other people to come on them and to be a part of these steak dinners, just one or two at a time. And they became something. People were like, "I want to come back for the next one." I was at one of these one time. I said to the guy, "You wouldn't believe this message I got from somebody saying, you know, I can't believe you're coming off as happy and this and that." Because to me, Book of Mormon teaches front to back and the the Bible. That if we're willing to forgive and change our ways, the Lord will bless us. And the example in the Bible, Book of Mormon is the Lord blesses you right away. He can't mm -hmm. take away all our consequences, but he starts blessing you right away. And um, so I said, I, I got this letter and and my one friend there says, yeah, I said, people are saying people are wondering how you can be going to church and can be happy. And it's just like, wow, really? Like. But again, this is a yellow school bus thing, right? Yep. Everyone in the yellow yep. school bus doing their own thing. And I'm not judging anybody. If I start judging people, then my class on judgment, I'm getting demoted a few years and I have to go back and work on that. So <laughs> I just look at it as that's where they are. And I'm not holding, I'm not labeling them. I'm not whatever. It's just an interesting look into this gospel of Jesus Christ, which is all about repentance which is improvement, which is trying to make changes to draw you close to Heavenly Father. And I'm going through it in the biggest way you can. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard thing, but you, it's, there's a lot of blessings in it too. One of the things that, that I think people are curious about is, 
you know, we're given at baptism and confirmation the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then the right. idea that the gift is sort of rescinded at the point that your membership is withdrawn. Did you feel that? No. Um, I felt shame and a lot of things. I had a, a guy come into my young single adult ward one time for family home evening, and we were trying to prepare the, the young single adults for the beginning of the school year. And so we had him come in and talk about dealing with stress. And, and one of the things he did is he brought a chart of emotions and feelings and said, okay, when you're feeling something, identify what it is you're feeling and make it more manageable that way. And that's one of the things I was doing all the way through this. And so I know friends and others that have felt all the spirit left my life at that point. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I didn't lose the spirit. I'm just saying I, I continued to have feel the spirit in circumstances. Um, I big difference I had was my spiritual experiences for a period of time. As I looked back at that point, that the, the, the experience, spiritual experiences I was having were for other people in my calling. Mm -hmm. I was I was being helped for them, and the Lord does continue to bless the people who are seeking their blessings. I had an experience right before everything blew up where um, young single adult asked me for a blessing of comfort as they were looking for guidance. And so I gave them a blessing. When I was done, they said, you know, pretty much everything you said is in my patriarchal blessing, hmm. which I thought that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you know, doesn't make me a patriarch, doesn't make me anything. It just meant that I still, the Lord still uses imperfect people to bless his saints who are striving to, to seek guidance and help from him. Um, after this happened, of course, I'm now going through, what is it I'm feeling? I'm feeling shame. I'm feeling embarrassment. I'm feeling sorrow. I'm feeling hurt. I'm feeling all these different feelings. And so you don't feel the spirit very much when you're burdened by all that stuff. You wouldn't, if you're a member, you wouldn't, if you're not a member. Sure. Um, but I did start doing some things to, I, I have a post on it. I call it recalibrating with the spirit. Um, I made sure I kept praying and there were times I did that whole thing. You learned about like it, the youth where it's like, well, pray and ask heavenly father, what he thinks of you. I did that. And that was a wonderful experience. I didn't do it all the time, but there were a few times where I was really down. And so I just reached out. Do you still love me? And I knew he did. And I found that there was a go-to. There's some music that would always bring the spirit in the past into my life. Sure. I'd go to that. Um, I found that my easiest go-to was when I said my prayers over my food. For some reason to this day, when I sincerely offer gratitude and ask heavenly father to bless the food i uh i can feel the spirit there and hmm. so i did things like that everything i could along the way to try and um build my relationship with heavenly father you know it's uh, there is the gift of the holy ghost but we all have the light of christ and yep. and even as an excommunicated member it, like one of the things i found very interesting is I could tell very clearly when people were taking that spirit away from me. When, when now I, I'd better clarify that. I could feel feel very clearly interactions with some people where the spirit would leave, hmm. where it was like this is void, this is not good. And then there was others where people would be like, "Hey, wow, that's good. That guy's got the spirit with him." And so you do all you can to try and have more of that person in your life. Sure, sure. So, so, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I felt like you hear of converts that say, well, there's something about that individual. Well, I know what that something is. Mm -hmm. And so because I knew what that something was, I went seeking it. Was there ever a time uh, or has there been a time um, where, you know, using your parable of the school bus is the way to get to school that you thought, you know what, maybe I, maybe a motorcycle is the way to go. Maybe walking maybe walking is the way, maybe that bicycle, you know, maybe it's not this yellow school bus at all. Right. Um, well, Satan throws everything in your head. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I have friends who I, I love dearly that were like, well, you could go try drinking now. You could go yeah. try this now or try that now. It's like, yeah, I guess I could, but yeah, rum springer it's Mormon rum springer. Yay. <laughs> but that was never my nature in the first place to go do those things. And so I just felt like, again, tying back into my, those years of sitting behind the bishop's desk. Well, if I do that, it's just going to hurt my relationship with Heavenly Father. Why would I do something that's going to hurt that? 
mm-hmm. no matter what the relationship is like with the church at this point, um, I know what's expected of me. And so why wouldn't I do those things to try and, and stay with it? So yeah, the tempta- there is the thought, well, you don't have to go back. But I wasn't about to go down that path. I, I have too much of a testimony. I know I know the gospel of Jesus Christ is real. And I know this is the church he's instituted to help us. Yeah. So I'm getting back on that yellow bus whenever they'll let me back on. It is a difficult thing, though. And I think one of the hardest parts about it, because of the shame that exists, and then almost, you know, I make the joke of a, of a rum springer, but it's like, you know, no rules. And right. then maybe people want to experience that for a minute because they're curious or or whatever the thing would be. And and then I think in some ways that becomes harder. I think reflecting what you said at the very beginning of the conversation, I think is hard too. If, you know, what it's really about is a relationship with, you know, God, our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, do you need the church to have that relationship? You don't. And so then it becomes right. a, a far more... Um, what nuanced relationship because you go, okay, I can have this relationship with God and Jesus. And also there is this church. And so I, I think it's a unique perspective that I don't think um, short of maybe a couple other kinds of experiences that people really come to differentiate or to uh, have you know, the different, the different um, perspective as far as that goes. I don't, I think unless you're you're put in a position where you have to consider that. I don't think that you do. And you sort of lump God and Jesus and the church all together. Very clearly. And very clearly, there is a divide there. Um, I, I hope this doesn't sound terrible. I don't know how I say now that I know the church of Jesus Christ is true. Because what does true mean? Yeah. Right. It's like, to me, true kind of means it's it's exact, it's whatever. I look at it as it is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It includes Jesus Christ, but it also includes Latter-day Saints. Mm-hmm. And that's where it becomes uh, mucky sometimes. And that's where it becomes hard and, and hard to... And so we start thinking, well, the Latter-day Saint thing is the Jesus Christ thing, but it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, the the church of Jesus Christ is truly Jesus Christ's church. I, I believe that whole church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is truly Christ's church. Um, but it's, it's well, can I read a quote? Yes, please. I love this one. It's by Sister Virginia Pierce from General Conference 1993. She says, you mean your ward has real people in it? Ones who are sometimes selfish or self-righteous, unskilled or undependable? I'm so glad. How could it be a real laboratory for practicing gospel principles like patience, long suffering, charity, and forgiveness if there were no people or situations that would require the use of these principles? The miracle of it all is that we are real people put into a, an ingenious structure designed by God to help us become like him. Hmm. Hmm. And and that's what the yellow school bus experience is. And yes, you can find God outside of the church. I'm not saying that you can find peace, but you can't find the ordinances. You cannot find, um, and, and you know, I think one of my posts is about scout troops. You went to scouts? Sure. Did you get your Eagle Scout? No, come on. I knew you were going to okay. ask me that. I got. I, I made it to star. I was a star okay. scout, and then I sort of dropped out. Fair enough. But I think we, we need to think more like scout troops, because in the scout troops, there's guys working on their Eagle Scouts. And there's guys that are just there because mom said need to, you need to go. Mm-hmm. And there's people that are there because... Well, their friends are there and it's something mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. And and the guys working on their Eagle Scouts don't usually say don't come to the guys not working on their Eagle Scouts. And the scout leader doesn't say don't come. They want you to come work on whatever badge you want. If you only want to make star level, fine, do star level. But this troop is a better place because we have more people in there and a variety of people in there. And the more variety of people, the more somebody's going to find a friend. Mm-hmm. The more rich you'll find somebody like him, that whatever, and feel more comfortable being there. I think the church could learn from that. Now, when I say the church, I don't mean the leadership of the church. I think the members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, if they would realize not everybody going to church needs to be working on the celestial kingdom, Mm -hmm. right? You Mm -hmm. come, whoever you are, that's that Gordon B. Hinckley quote, bring all that you've got and see if there's anything good we can add to it. Maybe there's one more badge you want to work on. And if that's as far as you want to go, fine, still come. 
you know, sometimes in the church we think, well, they only come for the social aspect. So what? Yeah. The, the ward's a better place if people are only coming because, hey, that's one place they come where they feel welcome or they feel like it's doing something for them. Great, come. You come and be yourself. And and uh, and we we get caught up sometimes and, and then we start judging. Others. Well, that person's not going to the temple every week. Okay, but they're working on something in their life. Sure. And and we just need to love. I mean, the example of Savior through all that I've been through, I've gone through the New Testament, the the four Gospels over and over and over. It's, you know, with the life of Christ. There's so much good in the life of Christ. And there's so many things. It, we're really good in the church at comparing ourselves to Lamanites. Sure. I'm not a Lamanite. I don't do this. I don't fight against the leaders. I don't whatever else. But the Lamanites served a purpose. They kind of pricked us and kept us straight and narrow. Well, look at the Pharisees and the scribes in the New Testament. Aren't they kind of the same? They sure. kind of, when you're trying to do what's right, but they're even more dangerous because they're the ones inside the church. No, I'm not trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to say anybody actively going to church and going to the, the, the temple regularly is a Pharisee, but that's a greater risk. You know what? I'll you're going to the church every week. There. You're a I'll say it. I think there are. I 100% think there are. There are people that I meet that I go, you are missing the point of what you are doing. I'm glad you're here. I think it's great what you are able to take as a benefit to your life. But I think in this particular aspect, you have missed the point of what God was trying to teach you. Right. And but the challenge for Richie is you can't really dwell on that and nope. you can't go say that to him and you can't tell anybody else about it if you want to maintain your grade level and whatever grade level you're talking to about judging others. Sure. And I don't mean judging others as making the call of, that would be a poor decision to go hang out with that guy on a Friday night. I'm talking sure. about judging others as I'm labeling you and not going to talk to you or going to shun you or say, how can you go to church and be happy every week with what I've heard about you? Mm. The the uh, perspective that you have on uh you know who and how should people should be at church I think is unique. I don't think that um I'm not saying you are alone in it, but I don't think if people really stopped and thought about what they think people are at church for, we sort of have this um this adopted mantra that if someone asks us that we go, well, church is for the sinners, not for the saints, you know, that kind of thing. Right. We sort of offhandedly will say yeah. in the in the same way that like when when people will say, oh, do you guys believe in the cross? And you say, oh, no, we celebrate the life, not the death. Right. right. We don't really right. think about it. We just have been sort of told right. this is how we do it. But to really think. Is the church for those that are whole? What does that even mean? No, it's for those that that can can benefit from it. And like you say, maybe they benefit from community and they don't they don't believe, you know, 99% of it, but they believe in the community aspect of it and the serving other people, and that's what they go for. Who is anyone to say no, don't be there for that? you know, betterment that the, that the church brings. And obviously there are people who come because they're just seeking more knowledge and enlightenment and, and, uh, right. you know, spiritual growth from going to the temple and, you know, different aspects of their leadership calling. There are all those things, but I think that we very quickly, and especially here in the state of Utah, go a member of the church is a, it's not B, it's not C, it's not D. And so in some of the wards, some of the areas and uh, neighborhoods and those kind of things, people think, well, listen, I'm not A, so I'm not going to go. But they could very easily be found within the walls of the church if the if the vision of what the church was for was just expanded even a little bit. Right. Yep. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back in the third block. Uh, there are three questions that we ask everyone. I'll ask those of you. Plus, we got some other stuff we need to get to before our time is done. We'll come back and do that in the third block of the cultural hall. Here in the third block of the Cultural Hall, remember, you can find us on all the social media sites that you uh, would participate in, like TikTok. We're on the TikTok. We're not doing anything there yet, but you can find and follow us for the second that we start to do that on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. It's all at the Cultural Hall, and we would hope that you would find and follow us there. Uh, also, while you're online, you can step over to onesheep.blog. That is David's blog that he's referenced. You can find a link to it in the show notes if you want to click over and read some of the things that he's written. Uh, I would be curious to know from you, uh, what are the things, if I were to say to you, what is a one or two things 
that you wish the general membership of the church knew about uh, having membership withdrawn, whether it's your experience, whether it's the process, whether it's things that maybe you didn't know was going to happen or feel or or think about or whatever. What's one or two things that that if you could grab a member of the church or a whole congregation by the ear and say, listen to this, what's the thing you'd say? I don't know that I anticipated that question. Um <laughs> I would say that the individuals that have lost their membership need the parable the Savior spoke of where you go after the one. They need, it doesn't mean that you agree with what they've done. It doesn't agree with, that. You, it mean that you um, condone any of it or whatever, if even what you've heard about them is accurate. But what they need, what we need is to go after them because that's what the Savior taught very clearly and plainly. What we need is to not judge them, even though maybe they've, you know, clearly been judged by the Lord to, mm -hmm. to not have a membership or whatever else, but we can't get trapped in that. The first thing I felt very strongly is I need to forgive everybody of everything. Mm. And um, I can't hold anything back. The Savior makes it very clear. He's not going to forgive us if we don't forgive others. So right off the bat, I knew I need to forgive everybody of everything and not hold anything over them um, in my own mind. But they need to know that these individuals are not. They have hearts. They um, are hurting. They need somebody and the Lord needs you to go after them which is what I'm trying to do with my blog and what I'm trying to do with something we can talk about in a minute, but, but um, they are not off the covenant path just because they sinned. Nowhere do we hear about being on the covenant path and you're off it. If you commit a certain level of sin, even loss of church membership, that's mm -hmm. part of the repentance process. And, and it's very clear that, um, well, President Hinckley has that quote from the, it's in the October Enzyme or, or Liahona of last year, where he talks about Hesed and, and the love the Savior has for us. And um, it's very clear in there that, that he will come after us. Once we have covenanted with him, uh, made a covenant, be a baptism or whatever, um, he will come after us. We still matter to him. Whether or not we matter to the members is, you know, we should. Sure. But if if uh but you want to stand out as a member that the thing that the way i've really strengthened a lot of my understanding of christ-like attributes in christ is the way people treated me in christ-like ways mm. um there are those who shun you there are those who don't answer your text there are those mm. who and and so be it. i don't judge them for it i don't know what they've heard i don't know what they're feeling maybe maybe it has nothing to do with anything so i can't judge them on it sure but certainly it's got to be some that just don't want me in their life because of something they heard. Sure. Um, but there are those who come out of the woodwork. I have a guy, <clears throat> when he heard I was going through this, he took it on himself for over a year straight. Every weekday morning, he would call me. He was an early getter upper and he'd call me at I don't know, 7, 7.30, whatever. Just, hey, what are you doing today? What's going on today? He's not from my ward. He's not from my stake. Of course, you don't have a ward or stake, but he's not from any. He's just a guy that that saw an opportunity to minister to somebody. Hmm. And and it wasn't every day talking about what I was feeling or hurting about. Sure. It was just it was just, hey, what's going on today? And talking about the truck he's having remodeled or whatever. Right. <laughs> like <clears throat> it's. um people need like we do that the lord will bless you you know many times i've prayed for that guy and his family yeah. because of what he's done for me yeah um it's it's just it's amazing whether or not you want okay, I'll, I'll say this one is to answer that question whether or not you want to be a part of that individual's coming back to the church is your choice but if you want to get involved and be a part of it it's a wonderful thing for that individual. I can't imagine the Lord doesn't bless you abundantly. Sure. There are, there's a handful of guys that I kind of let in that 
I had certain parameters I expected if I was going to trust somebody to to help me through this. And um, boy, I think the world of those guys. When you got a guy, <clears throat> I have a, a friend who's been asked several times by people we mutually know, hey, what do you know about Dave? You know, what, what have you heard about Dave? Nothing. Well, are you still friends with him? Yeah. Well, what do you know about what he, I don't know anything. Well, don't you talk to him? Yeah, all the time. Well, how come you don't ask him? Because my friend, doesn't matter. If he wants to tell me, he'll tell me. Sure. And and, and uh, it even happened to him here just not long ago at the front, at the desk of the temple, where the guy at the front of the temple, goes, what do you know about him? Yeah. And he's like, doesn't matter. I'm his friend. Yeah. And and yeah, I, I don't know much of anything. And how do you not love a guy like that? You yeah. know, and, and then the guy proceeded to try and tell him something. He just walked away and said, it's my understanding of the story. It's just, it was, I'm not, you know whatever. And, and I can't judge that other person. Again, it's just sure. somebody on the yellow school bus at whatever point they're at and whatever things, and they're way ahead of me and other things. Right. So um, it's just, I think there's great blessings for us if we strive to just be friends to them. Not everybody. I, I realize I'm a little unique. I'm trying to stay with the gospel and I'm whatever, but I think there's a lot of people who are, Sure. but whether you're trying to stay or not, I had people, you know, right after the rumors started going, I had a guy call me who lost his membership when I was a bishop. And uh, he calls me up and says, hey, I just want you to know, I heard some things. I don't care what they are. I just want you to know I care about you. And I really appreciate that you and so-and-so were the only two guys that ever called me hmm. after I lost my membership. Sure. And, and I really appreciate that. And I'm here for you if you ever need anything. How do you not, how do you not love a guy for doing something like that? Yeah. And that's a guy that's supposedly one of the lost, right? Yeah. And yeah. certainly we want him back in the church. We want him to have all the blessings of the gospel. And I hope some point he decides to do that. But but boy, he's got that down. Yeah. He's got that Christ like attribute down. Yeah. Uh you alluded to uh obviously we've got the blog. There's the link at the post, but you said uh, and also maybe something else that we'll talk about. I would love to give you the opportunity to talk about whatever the something else that is that you would like to talk about. <laughs> well, one thing I realized going through this, that I was a bishop. I was a bishop when a few people lost their membership or went through church discipline. And I realize now, gee, I wish I'd have done some things a little different. And and we probably don't have time to go into all that stuff. And we don't need to. But, but um, I realized there really isn't anything. You really do feel like that's it. You're gone. Go stand in the other end of the field. Go somewhere. Go hide in the trees. Um and it just feels like that. Not every, even when you have an awesome state president, I've got an awesome state president, right? Mm -hmm. But even then, they, they've got a lot of things on their plate. Sure. And they can't be everything you need. And so I've recognized that I feel like something could be done to try and help individuals going through this, whether they choose to come back to the church or not. Um, so that's why I started the blog, first of all, to reach out. But then I heard another podcast with somebody else talking about somebody who'd lost their membership and a blog and uh, and had blogs. And I looked at their blogs. It's like, well, it's a couple of years old and they got rebaptized. And I'm sure I assume, but they never answered me when I said, was there anything for you with that? Um, <clears throat> I saw one lady in 2018 was on the Internet going, my husband's lost his membership. I'm trying to find some support group for him, somebody they can talk to. And you read the notes and they're like well he must be an adulterer and blah 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 it's just like well what's that you know that's yeah. again it's if they're on the bus if they've left the bus or not members i can't speak to that i don't know i don't know what once you've left the church i have no idea maybe your views are the same as the church maybe they're not i don't know what they're in so i can't speak to that but if you're a member of the church and and portraying that front then um that's sad that that's when she's looking out. So my goal is to start a, um, hopefully a weekly group um, where people uh, uh, online, do we call it like the zoom kind of meeting, whatever yeah. else once a week where, um, where we can get together. And I, my thought initially was ARP style. Um, I say that by, well, let's read some gospel thing to begin with. And I'm starting to work on what those will be. But then let's go around the circle and let's just talk about. And when I say around the circle, of course, it's virtual. And I don't care if you're in Atlanta or Toronto or where you are. As long as we all speak the same language, we can sure. we can sit and talk. And, and let's talk about what it's like to go back to church the first time. 
to find mm. the guts to do that or what it's like if you've got a child being baptized yeah and and you cannot do that or for me my mother passed away two years ago and i was not allowed to speak at her funeral because it was in the funeral home but because a member of the church or a, a um a bishop or branch president, I don't remember which or what he was, uh, was conducting the meeting. So my state president said, no, you can't speak at it. And so because of the hand, the way he interpreted the handbook and so be it, that's his call and, and whatever else I did the family prayer, but you know, that hurts some other people too. Right. Sure. And, sure. but it, it, those things hurt. And so be, I'm not looking for sympathy for them, but I, I'm not looking for sympathy in any of this. What I'm doing. I, I would rather not have my name on the front of this at all. Sure. But somebody needs to do this and somebody needs to, say, hey, you know, I've kind of walked part of this path and let's kind of form an opportunity. So my hope is to get a group where we can sit and talk about those things and, and be supportive to one another as we go through this process. Again, if you don't want to go back to church, fine. I, I just don't want people in there to rip on the church. Sure. I want people who are going, how do I build my relationship with Heavenly Father again in a way that I can talk about it with people that kind of understand what I'm feeling, that have felt that pain and that shame and that isolation and the hurt and the everything else. Uh, I, I would be curious if someone is hearing that and either interested in helping out with that or just participating in that, what would be the best way that you would have them reach out to you? Go go to, well, onesheep.blog and and message me on that or you could go on instagram i have one sheep dot blog instagram as well Perfect. and um and you could go to either of those and message me and and we can connect up and and uh hopefully we can find some help for one another i love it uh just a couple of things before we kind of wrap this thing out uh i would be curious to know uh if you were surprised about anything after having your membership withdrawn here was the thing for me that i was surprised about um you you get sort of told hey you know what we're going to withdraw your membership and and you know when i was disfellowshipped there was this amazing comforting of the spirit when i was excommunicated it was not the case but within an instant uh the thing that my mind went to is i got to buy new underwear Oh and, yeah, and and I thought I found that, the best kind. By the way, oh, yeah? it took me a long time, but I found the best kind. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but everything uh in and around underwear was something that I that I had no idea would be uh, first of all an issue at all. Second of all, a thing that I thought about. Third of all, you know, a thing that I spent so much time about because so many people knew, um that I was a member of the church and that I had gone on a mission and I didn't want, you know, I didn't want everyone to know that this is what had happened. And, and you sort of broadcast it with your underwear, meaning because I, I do, understand, you know, you know, uh, theater shows and different things with costumes and stuff like that. You don't have garments with two blue lines for your fruit of the loom, so you have to spend right. a lot of time trying to find stuff that looks like garments. And then, are you being deceitful because you're pretending to wear these things? Like it was the everything around underwear and being excommunicated was something I didn't anticipate. That was, you know, I wasn't prepared for that, and and that hurts. Been over thirty years, and um, and so I still I still wear a, a white shirt underneath sure. and. And it was hard to go to the store and buy white shirts and think, oh, I hope I don't see anybody here who sees me buying white shirts and goes, why are you buying white? Like, you know, it was just, yeah. those things go through your mind. Um, I can't say that there wasn't a little bit at the time of, am I wearing a white shirt so that people don't realize or whatever else as time goes on, you get, so you just don't care. I wear a white shirt for two reasons. One as a holding place to get myself just, just so I'm still comfortable with wearing an undershirt. Mm -hmm. but two we wear the garment to remind us of the covenants that we've made in the temple i don't pretend for a second that i'm wearing an undershirt to replicate those covenants but i wear an undershirt to remind myself every morning when i get dressed that i want to wear those garments again mm. that's why i put it on every morning is I, I it's it's my reminder that this is my path i'm going to work my way back and that's what i'm going to do yeah all right. But yeah, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just was like, what, Hanes? Is that what I do? And I remember scouring the internet to find something yeah. that didn't have anything written on the band. 
Uh, and, <laughs> and that could be a thing that could be a part of that group you're talking about. Absolutely. Really, but it is in a way just comforting knowing that there are other people that are saying, what do we do with our underwear? What do we, and do you right. hold all the garments in a bag? And is that the hopeful thing? Or do you just say, Hey, you know what? I, that's a, this is a whole conversation for a different time. Look what we've done. Uh, there are three <laughs> questions that I ask everyone who steps into the culture hall. I, I presume, uh, at least with the first one, do you have a calling right now? And if so, what is it? Okay. I don't have a calling from the bus driver, but I feel like I get callings from the principal. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So what there is, are, do you feel like you're being called to right now? Well, there are people where I feel like, you know what, I can reach out to this individual and I can try and help them. And that's just ministering. It's the way it's supposed to be. Sure. But it doesn't have to be a sign. It's not supposed to be a sign for any of us. Yeah. Um, we do get some assigned within the wards, but but um, I try to be aware and pray for opportunities to serve other people. Um, it's not a calling. It's not a church calling. Sure. Um but I'm just trying to do what I can to, I'm trying what I can to help with the gospel, even though I'm not a baptized member at this point, I recognize its value. And I recognize it's it, the, the, um, the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and having a relationship with him and how that can lead us to the church and lead us to the blessings that are available there, which are even better. I, I don't know if they're even better, but anyway, you know, no, no, I mean, they're, I think they're different. I think, they, well, the one leads to the other, and they all work together once you get up there. Sure. Uh, the second question that we ask everyone is, if you could pick a calling, and I'm going to I'm gonna say, just to keep it within the confines of the yellow school bus, if you could pick a yellow school bus calling, uh, whether you're making one up or one that already exists, what would you pick? Okay, when I was a bishop, I got to the point that when someone moved into a ward, I would phone their previous bishop. And I'd say, okay, imagine that you're starting a brand new ward and you have nobody in any callings, but you have this individual and you've got to put a calling for them. Considering what their skills are and abilities and where they can still grow, where would you put them? Mm -hmm. And I would use that as a, as a starting point, you know, good information leads to good inspiration. I would use that as a starting point to try and find out where's a good place for this person to serve. It gives you an idea of, of what skills they've already developed. So my feeling is, this may be a hokey answer, but I would want whatever somebody determined is the next best calling to me to help me grow. I like that. I like that. I was yeah. really hoping you were going to say uh, neighborhood welcoming committee when new people move in, because that oh, is a jam. Welcome. This is the best store. Here are the best restaurants. That's there you where the ship lives. Welcome to the neighborhood. Uh, well, I just moved into my neighborhood the beginning of February, so I don't. I, I need that person. You need the best. See, see, That's right. <laughs> these are these are pertinent callings. Uh, the final question we ask everyone: we ask you to interpret it however you may, but the question remains: What is your favorite part of your faith? Okay. When I was in grade one, I remember being told in school that my grandkids would be living in an ice age. And then in high school, I was told there was a hole in the ozone and acid rain and then all these other things. Now, I'm not belittling the fact that there's climate change and whatever else. I'm just saying from a young age, that terrified me. I don't like being cold. Sure. And uh, what I love about the gospel of Jesus Christ is my understanding that he's in charge. And that as crazy as the world is, for whatever reason, I'm not trying to get political or anything like that. I'm just saying... Whatever's going on, whatever's confusing, um, I know that God's in charge. And I know that in my personal life, I can let him be in charge too. I'm a big believer that that scripture where we're, the Savior tells us to lose ourselves, that you know, we lose ourselves, we'll find ourselves. I don't necessarily think that's lose yourself in serving 40 hours a week in your calling. Sure. I don't think that means every weeknight you should be worrying about what you're going to teach on Sunday and who you're going to minister to and how you're going to. I don't think the Lord's asking us to run ourselves ragged and and ruin every other aspect of our life because of that. Sure. I do think that we're supposed to just let go and trust him. Mm. And and even though life is confusing at the big level and it's confusing at the personal level, um if we can just 
lose ourselves as far as, okay, Heavenly Father, what, what should I do? And, and not worry about building ourselves up to who we think we want to be, but build ourselves up to who Heavenly Father would have us be. Um, so all of that rambling, my favorite part is my trust in God. And through all of this, the one thing that's amazed me is how much I can trust him and his timing. The number of times over the last three years where he's pulled through at the last minute has given me such comfort to know that he's in charge. And as long as I'm doing my best to pay attention and focus on him, um, there's a whole other thing on how we can talk about that too. But, but, um, but I trust him and that's my favorite part about it. That gives me a lot of peace. Well, uh, people will find a link to your blog in the show notes and uh, be sure to reach out to David if you're interested in that support group. I would be, for whatever value I may be able to bring to something like that, would uh, be open to to dropping in on those as you start to get them uh, up and going. Maybe not every single time, but certainly a perspective of, of um, you know, kind of coming through on the other side of what that would be like. Uh, so let me know if there's anything that I can do in that respect. Uh, Dave, we hope that this episode has nourished and strengthened your body, that if you're not healthy enough to listen this week, that you'll be healthy enough to listen next week, and that when the time comes, you will be able to travel home in safety. In the meantime, we'll be saving a seat for you on the back row of the Cultural Hall.